So we can basically give the body a, a lesser physical stimulus um, for adaptation, but still cause it to adapt by changing these hemodynamics and, and increasing uh, the physiological intensity or physiological difficulty that's associated with this, what would appear to be a relatively easy training session. That Triathlon Show, episode 87. Hey, Merry Christmas, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, a Christmas Day special. This is the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com, and I really, really hope that you're having a wonderful, wonderful Christmas day, and that you're listening to this episode a day later or so to make sure that you have spent all t- the time possible on Christmas Day with your loved ones, with your family and today I am joined by Brendan Scott, who is a leading expert on the topic of blood flow restriction training, or BFR for short. We'll talk about that and how to use uh, restrict blood flow to the working muscles in resistance or endurance training by applying pressure using pressure cuffs or just any cuffs, and how this can have some very interesting and impactful benefits for athletes. And in addition to those benefits, some of the the questions and the topics that we, we cover are the practical application of BFR, any potential drawbacks that may come with it, who should use it and when, what times of season may be beneficial, and what specifically are its potential benefits in, in endurance training, which is an even newer application of BFR compared to resistance training, which has been around for a bit longer. First, this episode is sponsored by Precision Hydration. They offer electrolyte drinks in different strengths, up to three times stronger than traditional sports drinks, because everyone loses a different amount of sodium in their sweat, from 200 mg per liter up to as much as 2000 mg per liter. And personally, I use their 1500 mg per liter strength for preloading before events, and in racing and training, I use the 1000 mg per liter version. And the way that I got to those numbers is taking their free online sweat test on precisionhydration.com, which is also linked to in the show notes. And if you want to buy their products, including electrolyte drinks with specific kinds of electrolyte sodium content, use the discount code that triathlon show all one word for 15% off your purchase. So my guest Brendan Scott is a PhD and a lecturer in strength and conditioning at the Murdoch University in Perth, Australia. And in addition to researching blood flow restriction training, hypoxic training and athlete monitoring, he teaches and supervises students and he has consulted with professional athletes and uh, from a range of sports, uh, from rugby, football, soccer and, and powerlifting and strength sports, of course. And he is a certified strength and conditioning uh, coach with the, with the ASCA. So let's just dive right into the interview and hear more about this exciting topic of blood flow restriction training, BFR. All right, Brendan from Murdoch University, you're an expert in blood flow restricted training. So this is a really fascinating hot topic in especially the strength training world and resistance training, but also becoming a pretty big thing, or at least in the research world, in endurance training, it's becoming a bit more uh, prevalent. So it's a pleasure having you on the show. Welcome, mate. Uh, Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here talking with you and to your listeners. Yeah, great. So why don't we start? Because this is a, a topic, blood flow restricted training or BFR, that I, I am pretty sure that most listeners won't actually have heard of. So we need to start from the very basics and talk about what is BFR, blood flow restricted training, really, from an overview perspective. Right. So um, you're right in that blood flow restriction training is kind of a novel and definitely not a mainstream training stimulus at the moment. Um Some of your listeners might have seen people doing exercises in a gym-based environment with cuffs wrapped around the top of their arms or top of their legs or some sort of elastic wrap. Um, And essentially what the goal of blood flow restriction training is, is to change what we call the hemodynamics, so to alter the amount of blood going into and and out of a limb. So um, early research used really high pressures to really try to completely cut off or occlude blood flow going to the working muscles during exercise, but 
we've since established the past five years or so, there's been a bit more research to really tell us that we need to set the pressure at a moderate sort of level so we can maintain blood flow into the limb. So we're still getting some delivery of blood and nutrients it carries and particularly oxygen to the working tissues. Um, but we're occluding venous return. We can do that because veins are smaller than arteries. They're more superficial. They're closer to the surface. They're just easier to clamp down and, and stop blood flowing through them. So we ideally look to set pressures so that blood is still going into the limb. It's not coming back out of the limb during exercise. And most research using this technique is done in a strength training format. So we do light load resistance exercise with this blood flow restriction in place. And um, we see pretty large increases in muscular development. But there's also um, probably what your listeners are more interested in, so a, a growing area of research starting to examine this from the perspective of endurance sports or cardiovascular fitness parameters. So I suppose that's BFR in a nutshell. Yep, that's a brilliant overview. And we will discuss both, both the resistance training side because there are uh, some clear potential benefits for triathletes on that specific resistance training side of things as well to BFR. But as you say, the endurance training doing, for example, cycling or running uh, in with uh, restricted venous return, that, that c can also have some potential good implications for for athletes so 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 what are the benefits of of altering the hemodynamics using bfr um well i suppose the the most often talked about benefit from the resistance exercise point of view is that we can get large changes in muscle size and muscle strength that we would typically see following sort of a bodybuilding or a powerlifting weightlifting type of training regime um, but we can do that with really light weights. So what that does is it uh, means we decrease the total mechanical stress on the body, um, and that's good for people who might be recovering from some sort of injury. They might be uh, perhaps a master's athlete on reduced training loads because they can't recover with the same capacities when they were younger. Um, a whole host of reasons, maybe excessive travel in a recent training block, so uh, recovery capacity is, again, slightly diminished and so we can basically give the body a, a lesser physical stimulus um, for adaptation, but still cause it to adapt by changing these hemodynamics and, and increasing uh, the physiological intensity or physiological difficulty that's associated with this, what would appear to be a relatively easy training session. Yeah, and, and actually, I think that for endurance athletes, this is... Uh, particularly beneficial because we're not as well trained in performing the movements with the same uh, mechanical proficiency as bodybuilder or weight bodybuilders or weightlifters that for for whom it's their primary interest we're doing it as a uh, as a supporting training session so so we're not we're not as proficient with those with those movements put simply and and that all obviously increases injury risk a bit but if you can do those movements with a lighter weight then than that and still get the same strength building benefits then then that's uh, a massive benefit for for any endurance athletes how does it work really what are the in uh, really briefly the mechanisms the mechanisms be without behind the bfr training <laughs> um so there's there's been a lot of research trying to uncover the mechanisms uh what what we think is really at play is firstly by limiting blood flow to the limb. We, we, we are limiting blood flow. We're not completely stopping oxygen delivery to the working muscles, but we're limiting it slightly. So we create a more hypoxic environment in the working tissue, and this increases the reliance or puts more of a shift towards anaerobic processes. Um, and because of that, we start to accumulate anaerobic byproducts. Um, now, this metabolic stress is sort of conducive to a few processes involved in, in muscle uh, building so we, we have the increase in metabolic stress causes the muscle fibers that have been recruited to fatigue faster so as they fatigue the body has to recruit more muscle fibers to produce the same amount of force and continue to lift that weight so if you're lifting a, a 10 kilo weight the muscle fibers that you initially recruit to lift that load become fatigued more rapidly so a greater portion of the muscle is recruited to lift that weight as the session goes on and then if more of the muscle is active well, more of the muscle has to adapt um, so the metabolic stress seems to be a, a key, playing a, a key role here. Um, we also see it, it's sort of a hypothetical model at this point in time, but the, the pump, the swelling response that we get in muscles, bodybuilders often talk about the, the pump, and um, we think that potentially this swelling of the muscle cells could have an anabolic role in that 
it might be causing the muscle fibers to sense there's some sort of a threat to their integrity, right? So there's some sort of damaging response, uh, damaging stimulus occurring, and so that might be initiating some signaling processes that cause muscles to reinforce themselves and to build larger, stronger muscle fibers. Um, there's also been a, a lot of research that's shown increases in particularly growth hormone, although recent research has shown that those systemic increases in, in hormone concentrations after exercise are probably short-lived and too short-lived to play a large role as far as um, the overall uh, accretion of, of muscle protein is concerned. But it really seems to be coming through this increase in uh, metabolic stress, the more motor units or more muscle fibers being recruited in this swelling response resulting in uh, increases in muscle protein building. Yeah, and that's the same kind of hypothesis as for why weight training, resistance training in general is good for endurance athletes to to teach us to to recruit more muscle. But then you you enhance that even further with with BFR if you compare to the normal resistance training, you get even more recruitment. So so yeah, that seems uh, seems interesting very much. What what about drawbacks? And there are some safety concerns uh, to some extent of it. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um. So a, a, a potential drawback, particularly from an athletic point of view, is that the, those sort of mechanisms I just spoke about predominantly work via hypertrophic pathways, right? So building muscle size, and that's what we think causes the increase in strength. And the increase in strength is the functional outcome that's going to ultimately enhance endurance performance or derivatives of it are going to enhance endurance performance. Um, but there's uh, increases in muscle strength, maximal strength that is, come largely via some neural adaptations as well. So we, like you just mentioned, you get better at recruiting the right motor units and turning on the muscle you want to contract and turning off the muscle, the antagonist muscle. And uh, a lot of these neural adaptations we haven't seen yet being upregulated by blood flow restriction training. So it seems like to optimize maximal strength um, then heavy, really heavy, high load resistance exercise without blood flow restriction is probably still king. Um, so that's, I guess, one potential drawback. Um, and as far as the safety is concerned, it's like any sort of exercise really is in that we have to make sure, first of all, that the exercise stimulus or the blood flow restriction is appropriate for the individual that's going to be applying it. So, uh, for example, we, we see large increases in uh, blood pressure when we, of course, wrap cuffs around our legs and try to do some exercise. Um, if you have a history of hypertension, of high blood pressure, well, this could be uh, tipping you over the edge into that dangerous zone as far as the, the pressure on the vasculature is concerned. Um, there's potential also with blood pooling within the limbs to have an increased risk of uh, clotting in the vasculature. Um, now, that's never actually been reported in the literature, and there's a, a lot of studies that have looked in this uh, and haven't found any increases in clot formation or um, decreases in the processes that cause clots to be broken down, etc. But if someone has a history of clotting diseases or a, a, perhaps a genetic predisposition towards those disorders, then that's the kind of person I'd be a little bit more um, concerned with implementing blood flow restriction training with, I suppose. Yeah. yeah what, what you mentioned there about uh, the first drawback about uh, the this uh, BFR working through uh hypertrophy rather than than maximum strength and neural adaptation that's uh very timely i just a few episodes ago i did a review of uh the the existing literature about resistance training for for endurance athletes and what kind of training is beneficial and whether it is beneficial and that's one of the main takeaways that that it is those neural adaptations that in most cases we are after uh so so i guess that that means that maybe we need to be a bit selective about which kinds of athletes that we're we're putting on this kind of bfr training and maybe somebody who is really really uh a small athlete with not a lot of muscle mass at all uh, like somebody for example i would imagine that a lot of runners would be would be good candidates because they tend to like not have a lot of muscles whereas swimmers would have more muscles if if you come into triathlon from a swimming background so then you might not necessarily need a lot of hypertrophy but you you would rather want to do strength training just by increasing those neural adaptation but the, on the running side of things then i think when you turn into triathlon from running then increasing the muscle mass overall might be beneficial so that's just me thinking off the top of my head do you have any any comments about about that no i would i would completely agree i think um 
you don't want to be the sort of traveling salesman that says blood flow restriction training is the, the next greatest thing and it's going to fix everything that is wrong with resistance exercise. Um, there, there's certain populations, certain kinds of people that this could be beneficial for um, and others that, uh, like I said, heavy weights training for those neural responses is still king. So that should be, I guess, the end goal of um, an endurance athlete's training program in the gym. Um, but there's certain times of the training year and the at periodized plan when maybe small blocks of blood flow restriction training could be beneficial. Like I mentioned, if there's excessive travel and so you just don't have access to a gym, for example, to do your heavy resistance exercise session. Maybe you can do some body weight exercise or exercise just with some uh, power bands, therabands, add blood flow restriction into the mix to uh, upregulate the adaptive potential of the muscle to that very light stimulus that normally wouldn't cause an adaptation. And then what you're going to see is a, a bit of an attenuation of the disuse um, decreases in strength and muscle size that you get. So um, it, it, it's really important with this as it is with any training method to implement it at the right time and consider the person that you're actually working with and if this is going to be the optimal way for them to boost their training adaptations. Yeah, good good points. What, what about its use in endurance sports, uh, in running, cycling, or even other sports if it's been researched? What do we know about, about that? And, and is that something that's worth trying? Um, there's much less research on BFR in an endurance context, but there is a, a, a bit of work that's uh, emerged recently. So there was one study published in 2010 from a Korean research group that looked at implementing blood flow restriction walking in college basketball players. Um, so one of the nice things about the very light intensity of blood flow restriction training is that you can train more frequently. So there's a a number of studies that use this training twice daily with the same exercises and because we don't see large amounts of muscle damage and, and fatigue resulting, well, you can sustain that. So um, these researchers had basketball players who were already quite well trained, um, just walking on a treadmill at roughly five kilometers an hour um, for a couple of minutes, morning and afternoon. And after two weeks, they saw um, about 11.5% increase in VO2 max, maximal aerobic capacity in the blood flow restriction walking group, not in the control group, and about a 2.5% increase in anaerobic capacity measured via a, a 30 second Wingate test on a bike. Um, so, some functional outcomes, I suppose, from an endurance perspective in people who are already trained in, um, in a, a sport. Um, there's, I was reading another paper just recently on. Uh, blood flow restriction, four weeks of interval cycling training with or without blood flow restriction. It was a relatively small sample size um, and they were recreationally active um, participants, so not highly trained endurance athletes. So I suppose you can take the results with a grain of salt from the perspective of highly trained endurance athletes. But um, the blood flow restriction group managed to increase time to exhaustion on a, on a time to exhaustion test by about 50% from their pre-training levels, um, but there was no change in the control group. So there's much more work to be done, but there still does seem to be some sort of a potent stimulus that arises from the changes in hemodynamics that um, give us some potentially beneficial training outcomes for an endurance perspective. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a couple of follow-up points on that. First, I saw that same study in the cyclists and I, and yeah, I so the same the same thing that that you mentioned that that they were recreationally trained, but at the same time, the the watts that they produced uh, and that they measured in as a I don't remember what the the training load was. It was something like fifty percent of VO two max, or maybe uh, the peak, peak. Percent of peak power. I think it was. Yeah. 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 So anyway, a low 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 output, but but still the watt numbers they had that printed out in in the abstract of the study and. And I mean, it's comparable to to what I see in the more beginner athletes that I coach. So, so even though they're recreationally trained, that doesn't mean that triathletes that have been training for a while even can't be in that same kind of demographic. And and one thing that you mentioned there about training twice daily and increasing the load, that's another thing that I saw an interesting anecdotal study with uh, one of the American top alpine skiers who was preparing for one of the Olympics. I, I think it might, might have been Sochi and and he got injured five weeks before and then to to not have a loss of muscle mass before the Olympics and he was working with would be a far before it really became even as uh, 
big <laughs> quote unquote as it is now uh, to to really try to to get to that muscle mass to remain or to sustain that as much as possible with just two training sessions per day with a very very light load as much as he could sustain after those injuries so that was yeah that, that was very interesting and fi- and finally one one paper that I saw in endurance studies was uh, from uh, New Zealand in in runners and and they had those kinds of 30 seconds intervals with 30 seconds rest and most of the variables that they measured they didn't have any changes between groups or the differences between groups all groups seemed to improve similarly except running efficiency that the BFR group had uh, more improvements in that uh, and significantly statistical uh, statistically significant uh, improvements compared to the control groups in in that so that was another interesting one and uh, i don't remember how many how many participants were in that study but uh, probably pretty small but but still there is some promising things there for sure for sure so let's talk a bit about its application so when when you get into the gym for example what what do you do what kind of equipment do you have and and when you get started with it should you see some expert first to to get the guidance and coaching in how to how to do bfr what what steps do we need to take if we are interested in getting started with this um, yes, yeah, so because it's not really a mainstream training method, there's there's very few people um, that I've seen with a lot of expertise in actually implementing this. A lot of people uh, just implement it at, after reading it quickly on a blog post and, and think they'll give it a try. So I suppose my advice would be, as I mentioned before, that it, there's potential safety implications. So it's good to have an idea of um, whether or not you might be contraindicated for doing blood flow restriction training. So there, there's a, a number of sort of screening processes that you can undertake to see if you've got high blood pressure or a history of clotting disorders, those sort of things. Um, and if you pass muster with those uh, sort of pre-screening processes, well, from a research perspective, what we look to do is to control the pressure that we apply as tightly as possible. So we will actually measure what we call the arterial occlusion pressure via ultrasound techniques, and that tells us the amount of pressure required to completely cut off blood flow. And then during the training sessions, we'll implement blood flow restriction with a percentage of that, so maybe 60% of arterial occlusion pressure. Um, But that equipment is obviously quite expensive and requires a degree of expertise to to operate. Um, And so there's more practical approaches that, that people have researched and it are found to be quite beneficial so probably the easiest way to apply this and to be honest the way i apply it myself if i'm actually recovering from shoulder surgery at the moment i've been using this exact method to do blood flow restriction with light loads um, just using elastic wraps so uh, power lifting knee wraps you often see power lifters um, competing with uh, just wrapped around their knees uh, you can wrap those around the top of the thigh and the way that you regulate the pressure there is on a perceived scale of of overall pressure. So you wrap these wraps around the top of your leg until you perceive that it's about a 7 out of 10 on a pressure scale. So with 10 being a really high pressures that causes pain, 0 being no pressure at all, you can barely feel the cuff is there. You wrap it till it's a moderate pressure um, but it's not causing extreme pain and then you do your exercise with that. Now for the upper body you can take the same cuffs but just cut them in half so they're half as thick uh, because for Uh, The upper body, smaller limbs, we require smaller cuffs and and lighter pressures to get the same changes in blood flow. So um, using that sort of perceptual approach and then judging exercise performance during the session. Uh, So, for example, if you do the standard resistance exercise session of 30 repetitions in the first set, then three sets of 15 following that, all with about 30 seconds rest in between and using a weight that's in the ballpark of 20 to 30 or maybe 40 percent of the maximum weight you can lift for a single rep um, then you, you should be able to with that weight if the pressure is set appropriately get through the workout if you uh, can only complete 50 percent of the repetitions because it just feels too difficult well the cuffs are probably wrapped too tight and on the other side of that if you d- get through the session and find it was really easy and then maybe you might need to wrap the cuffs a little bit tighter the next time so taking that really practical approach it's I suppose a little bit of trial and error, but pretty quickly after just a couple of attempts at it, you get quite uh, quite good at estimating the pressure and knowing exactly how it should feel when it's wrapped to the right degree of tightness to get those hemodynamic responses that you're really looking for, allowing blood into the limb but stopping it getting back out. Okay, that, that's actually quite 
a different answer to what I expected because just from reading a little bit about this in preparation for this episode, I, I got the impression that, that there are really only a couple of brands with the specific cuffs that are recommended and other sorts of cuffs are really not recommended at all. And and most blog posts, etc. that I read seem to really be a bit more cautious, I, I would I would say, but but it seems like we don't need to make it that complicated. I mean, this sounds sounds doable. Sure, you need to to be careful and aware of what you're doing, but but still very much uh, in the realm of possibility for just about anybody. Yeah, th- th- there is a there is a number of companies now that are beginning to produce equipment that that nicely regulates the pressure, um, and so that would always be my preference, if possible, to to go with a technology that you know exactly the pressure you should be applying and you can apply that directly and you know see the measurement on the dial or on the screen of the device. Um, but yeah, that there is a, a bit of research now that's shown that practical blood flow restriction application um, can provide the, the right sort of stimulus. Again, if you apply it appropriately, if you wrap too tight um, or, or if you're a little bit unsure about how it should actually feel and, and you... Um, apply too much pressure or do too many repetitions or leave the cuffs on for too long, not following the appropriate exercise, then definitely it can still be um, a detrimental stimulus. So yeah, always have to have your eye on that sort of safety aspect of things, but it's definitely something that's manageable for, for most people if, um, if they're uh, someone who doesn't have those contraindications and can do this safely. Okay, so so what about if if you have those cuffs where you can adjust pressure? Uh, you mentioned earlier that you can measure the the one hundred percent occlusion with ultrasound, but if you have those cuffs, do you still need to do that to get your baseline for what kind of pressure you need to set, or or do those more professional cuffs in some way take into consideration what you what you should apply as the pressure? Some cuff setups do take it into a consideration. You can just set, I want um, 50% of arterial occlusion pressure and the cuff will regulate um, to maintain that. Um, but there's, there's other uh, sort of formula that have been published and researched to predict how much pressure you should apply if you don't have a way to measure arterial occlusion pressure based on things like limb circumference, um, blood pressure just measured normally as you would at the doctor's, for example, um, limb size, uh, as I mentioned with the circumference and, and taking into consideration the width of the cuff. There's a, a few published formula um, that you can see online that give you an estimate of you know, uh, what type of pressure or the ballpark within uh, a range of, of pressure measures that would give you that beneficial stimulus not being too high but definitely not being um, too low. All right, yeah, brilliant. If if you can send me a link, if I don't find it myself on Google, so we can include that in the show notes, that of would course. be brilliant. So people interested can can check that out. Um, yeah, I think uh, is there anything that we haven't talked about when it comes to to BFR that you want to mention? Um, I think one thing we've touched on it a bit, but one thing I'll really encourage people if they're looking to apply this to do is to make sure that. It is going to be safe for them. So it might sound like the conservative researcher in me coming out, but it's probably not a bad idea to talk to your doctor and see if they think it's going to be an appropriate way to go. Because as I mentioned, it, it's not the be-all, end-all. It definitely has some implications in, in certain uh, phases of somebody's training or in the recovery process from injury or if there's some factor that's meaning that they can't specifically train with heavy weights. But um, like I said, safety always has to come first because you're definitely not going to win any races if you're um, too ill to participate. So <laughs> we need to make sure that everyone's exercising safely in that regard. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And also talk to your coach if you have if you have a coach to see to to learn about what those uh, those times in your periodization might be the best thing to to implement this if you want to to try this out. So I have a couple of bonus questions because you have a couple of other research interests as well in addition to BFR. And one is athlete monitoring. And uh, as I understand, it's uh, from a resistance training perspective. And uh, just a very general, broad, open-ended question. What, what can you share about athlete monitoring from that perspective that would be relevant for endurance athletes that, that are doing maybe one or two resistance training sessions per week as part of their triathlon training, for example? Sure. So athlete monitoring, I think, is a really important part of any athlete's overall training scheme. Um, 
And in resistance exercise, it's not typically, in my opinion at least, done very well. But of course, resistance exercise is a, a training stimulus and so it needs to be factored in to understand. So um, the way I think about monitoring is that there's two approaches you can take. You can monitor the external load, so um, how much weight was lifted in the gym, um, the total tonnage for a week, for example, or in your triathlon training, it's going to be distance covered, duration, number of efforts, average power, etc. There's a number of variables. But it's also good to take into account the internal load, so that's physiological measures, heart rate, lactate, oxygen consumption, um, and also some psychological assessments, ratings of perceived exertion. Uh, and where I think the training monitoring really comes in on its own is where you can look at the ratios between internal and external training loads. So by that I mean um, for a given external dose or a given training session in the gym, a given numbers of sets and reps and weight, uh, you will have it and it, you'll build it up over time if you continue training, but you'll be able to develop a library or, or a, net, a, a database that sort of says to you, for this type of training session, this is how my body responds with the internal training load. So this is my heart rate for a specific type of running session, for example. This is the session RPE that I'll often provide after this type of weight session. Now, if you start to see a dissociation between the internal and external um, measures of load, well, that to me indicates one of two things. If you start to see lower internal demands relative to the same external training stimulus or a high, higher um, external physical training stimulus, well, then you're probably getting fitter. You're having some beneficial adaptations because you don't your body isn't stressed as much by the same or a higher stimulus. But if you go the other way and now you're starting to have an increased physiological response or an increased perceptual response to the same or a lesser external training dose, well, then you might be in a state of overtraining, overreaching, or, or just general fatigue. So I think that's really what we're looking for with training monitoring because the idea of training monitoring right, is to inform our training. We, we need to be able to get numbers that we can quickly look at and say, okay, based on these monitoring numbers, I need to decrease my overall loads because I'm showing signs of fatigue or on the other side of it, I'm hitting the numbers that I would be expected to and I'm exceeding them. So maybe it's time to increase my overall training intensity or volume or the interaction because I'm adapting faster than we planned in my periodized program. So I think that um, the comparison between internal and external loads gives us an opportunity to really examine more closely how the athlete is responding to the training that we've prescribed via those external loads um, and get some extra information for altering prescription as a consequence of that. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. And, and that session RP, I think, is uh, so valuable, can be so valuable. And I think triathletes, generally, we measure a lot of things. And I think we do monitoring very well in many cases. A lot of triathletes use a software called Training Peaks to yes. uh, collect all sorts of data. And, but session RPE, the internal load, I think that's something that very few actually think about. But that can tell you so much about your overall training state, especially when you start to look at the trends of, of those session RPEs. So, so that's something definitely an actionable takeaway for, for the listeners. And that and that's also the session RPE is probably the only metric that we have at the moment that can cross work you do in the gym and work you do in the pool or running or on the bike. Yep. Right? So you, you can get a single metric that describes all the training that you do, which is a really big benefit of session RPE, I think. Yeah. So when you talked about the weekly tonnage that you lift, uh, going back to the resistance training, is that how is that measured? Is that on a per exercise basis or is it uh, exercise independent and it's just the entire session, all, all the different uh, exercises that you have in that session? So from the point of simplicity, most of the time it's done as the total weight you've lifted in a session inclusive of all exercises. And, and most people will look at that uh, for training sessions and then sum it for the week. Um, but if you break that down and think about some exercises are done against just body weight or just a portion of body weight, for example, a push-up, um, whereas some are done against some external load. So how, how do you um, factor in the, the body weight when it's only a portion of that mass that's being overcome, like that push-up example? Or if we're doing a bench press, that's pretty easy because we can just factor in the weight of the barbell. So that's something that from a simplistic point of view, it's pretty easy to do. You just multiply the number of sets times the repetitions times the weight you've lifted, add that all up for each exercise, and that gives you a metric. Um, but something that uh, we've started to work on at Murdoch is uh, 
Well, we don't think that that gives a true indication of the intensity of a training session. So, for example, if you do one training session on one day and between every set you have one minute rest and then the next day you come back and you do the exact same training session but this time you take five minutes of rest between every set. Well, the day where you rest five minutes between sets is going to feel much easier. You have more recovery. It's not as stressful as stimulus. The overall intensity of that session is lower. Um, and that's not factored in with the volume load metrics. So um, something that we have been looking into is um, we've turned it exercise density, basically taking that volume load and dividing it by the duration of training to give almost a kilograms lifted per minute type of metric that will give us an indication of not only um, the volume load that you've accrued, but how you've accrued that, how, how difficult that session should be based on how much recovery you've got um, or the density uh, of the, the weights being lifted. So, um, yeah, there's a, a number of ways that you can approach volume load. It's not a perfect system, but uh, it's definitely uh, going to help at least having that database beginning to be built of what type of volumes you can tolerate and handle when you compare back to the internal load metrics like we were talking about before. Yeah, that's good. Uh, finally, this is a bit of a long shot, but uh, you have done a lot of work, and I think your PhD actually was on hypoxia, but from a resistance training uh, standpoint. Is that right, or am I mistaken? That's correct, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was thinking, because I've been uh, in recent weeks exposed to hypoxic training in the pool uh, since joining a new swimming squad. Uh, so do you know anything about that and the benefits of, of doing that, like doing those long dives and, uh, uh, or yeah, from the endurance side of things, not going into the resistance training anymore, but, but any, anything that, that you happen to know about that? No, that's not something I've actually looked into too much. The, so you mean breath holding, for example? Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. So what we do is usually we take we take on our fins and then we do a dive where just in the streamlined position, arms uh, outstretched in front of us and just kicking underwater the entire 25 meters. And then we swim back and sometimes we actually either sprint back or we do butterfly back to really get that heart rate spiking and then a relatively long recovery after that and so yeah it is it is breath holding you you are just exhaling all the time and, and trying to make it and you repeat that maybe six times or so uh, on uh, one minute 30 seconds so it's a 10 minute set or so uh, that, that's just an example and and that's something that i know that in swimming is uh, pretty common to do at points not not too much but but do do that intermittently and at some points of their training season but in triathlon it's not something that's common to do that that hypoxic training so but i was just curious about what if there is any research about that but i guess i need to keep digging a bit because i haven't i haven't done that honestly i, I just thought about it since you yes I, I, i've heard people talking about it in the research world and i have seen a paper i haven't read the paper but i have seen a paper um, that looked at this in a little bit of detail. But I guess if we, we think about just free diving, right, where, where um, individuals will dive down to great depths and, and try to hold their breath for an extended period of time and over time they can train themselves to hold their breath for longer and longer, well, to me that suggests that there's some sort of adaptation occurring with potentially the usage of oxygen. I, I'm not exactly sure what the mechanisms would be, um, but... If there is some adaptations, well, potentially they could benefit sports like swimming and the swimming leg of a triathlon. So, yeah, there, there's definitely um, some research or I suppose some justification for doing research in that space for sure. Yeah, yeah. All right. So let's move into some rapid fire questions, starting with what's your favorite book, blog or resource related to uh, anything related to your field of expertise, really? Um, so I, I love going on Twitter and seeing a bunch of different feeds on Twitter. That's where I, I read a lot of the most interesting papers that I see. And a guy called Chris Beardsley out of the UK um, publishes a, a monthly strength and conditioning research review. And he's got a, a great Twitter account where he posts little infographics describing the findings of novel studies in a really sort of um, easy to interpret and informative way. So I, I'd say Chris Beardsley's uh, monthly S&C review. Great, that's uh, that's a follow. Uh, what's your favorite piece of gear or equipment? Um, definitely my weightlifting shoes, so I can go into the gym and actually squat properly. <laughs> and what do you wish you had known or wish you had done differently at some point in your career? Um, well, I'm I'm still quite young in my career, so I'm not having to reflect too far back, I suppose. Um, but 
I would probably, if I could go back and give myself some advice a few years ago, I'd say start reading more outside of your area of expertise um, because I think there's a lot to be gained. I've actually changed some of my thought processes or started to think about things in more detail in the resistance exercise world um, after talking to people who are more entrenched in endurance type of exercise or endurance um, uh, research. So I, I think it's a good idea to read outside of your direct focus or your, your little closed in scope to get some insights from sometimes outside of the box that can have a, a good application for the work that you do specifically. Yeah, I totally agree about that. And that's that's one of the reasons that I'm very interested in, in resistance training, because I think it, <laughs> it really adds to, to the endurance uh, coaching side of things. All right. Thank you so much, Brendan. It's been really great talking about blood flow restricted training and, and some other bonus questions as well. And uh, are you on Twitter or are there any places where we can uh, follow you and find out more about uh, what you're doing? Your, what you're I asking? am on Twitter. I am on Twitter. My handle is Brendo Scott. Um, I'm sure you can post a link in yeah, the, we will. Um, the show notes for that. But yeah, I try to post some stuff on there from time to time. Stay active. Brilliant. All right. Thanks again. It was uh, really great talking to you. Great. Thanks for having me on, Michael. Hope that you enjoyed that interview and uh, have a think about if this form of training may be for you. As I said in the interview, one of the things I started thinking about was how this could be used, especially for athletes with really scrawny body types like those from a running background to build some muscle mass that is needed in triathlon. But another main takeaway is that it isn't a silver bullet, as Brendan said. It can be used strategically at certain times of your periodization, but there's no need to become a wandering salesman about BFR, as Brendan said. So so work with your coach, or maybe just tweet somebody like Brendan and, and ask about their opinion of uh, what, uh, what the implementation of BFR in your training might be, and, and see if you get a reply. And I have a couple of really good related episodes on strength training. So a recent very well received episode was uh, number 81, the triathlete's strength training formula, where I cover all the research about and the practical application of that research, of course, about strength training for endurance sports. But also look all the way back to episode 15, Strength and Conditioning for Triathletes with Frank Velasquez. Uh, that was a really good one and uh, it's way back in the archives. So uh, you will hear a very inexperienced interviewer and, uh, and a very, very knowledgeable Frank Velasquez. You can find the show notes for this episode on thattriathlonshow.com. As usual, click through to this, this episode and leave your comments and thoughts about this episode. As I've said on a couple of past episodes, I really want to make the comment section on the show notes a place where we can discuss as a group what we learn in these episodes. Uh, I learn a lot as well. Uh, so this, for example, is a topic that's pretty new to me. I had a very surface level knowledge about it before, but not much more than that. So let's discuss it in those comments. If you want to make my Christmas even better than it already has been, although I'm recording in advance, I know it will be great because I will spend it back with my lovely family, then the best way to do so is to tell all your triathlon friends about this podcast that really, really makes my day every time you do. And the second best way would be to give this show a rating and review on iTunes or in your podcast app. Remember, I have that goal of before the end of the year, so six days from now, uh, get to 100 five-star reviews on iTunes. And uh, if the projections at the time of this recording are anything to go by, I'm not going to achieve that goal, so please, please, please help me get as close as possible. I would really, really appreciate that. You can go to scientifictriathlon.com forward slash rate where I show you exactly how to do that if you're not sure how it works. Finally, thank you again to Precision Hydration for sponsoring this episode. Really, I can't thank them enough because... This show takes a lot of work to, to get out two times per week and them sponsoring it really helps a lot to take a bit of the load off from that time investment. So go and check them out on precisionhydration.com and take their free online sweat test to get your personalized hydration strategy for your next race and use the discount code DATRIATHLONSHOW, all one word, for 15% off. If you want an interesting read for the Christmas period, 
one of the blog posts that I found particularly fascinating from their blog from is from a few weeks ago, actually. It was about how Jasmine Muller won, won the 24-hour time trial championships, and I'll link to that in the show notes as well. Uh, and uh, that's a very interesting read that you can go and have a look at. Thank you, as always, for listening. I can't thank you enough for that. I really appreciate you. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.